Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So believe it or not, rideshare drivers spend a ton of time on the road, and often it's at night or during dangerous times and even in dangerous places. And even though you might be the best driver in the world, you can't always control what other drivers are doing or not doing. Over the past couple years, there's been a number of lawyers popping up to handle Uber and Lyft cases. It seems like every time I drive down the streets in LA, I see another billboard or an ad on a bus. But today, we're going to be speaking with one of the first firms to establish a national brand specializing and rideshare accidents. So if you're ready, let's get moving. All right. So today I'll be talking with Bryant Greening, co-founder of Legal Rideshare, the only law firm in the U.S. entirely dedicated to Uber and Lyft accident and injury claims. So Bryant's company actually helps drivers and passengers recover things uh, like the costs associated with medical bills, lost wages, and pain and suffering after rideshare accidents. Bryant himself has a pretty cool background since he actually practiced as a personal injury lawyer, but he started getting a lot of questions from Uber and Lyft drivers back in 2014, 2015, as they were kind of going through their legal claims and after accidents and injuries. And, you know, what else is cool? Bryant is actually also a former Uber and Lyft driver. They're, the claims keep, you know, keep coming, really. Drivers yeah. are getting in accidents, and a lot of times it's not their fault. Um, but we're glad that we're here to help out, you know, when and if that happens. Got it. Yeah, no, I think it is a very interesting service that you provide. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, I think a few years ago when we first started talking, I was so excited to uh, basically partner with you guys because I think it is such a valuable service that you are providing. Before we get into the kind of nitty gritty and the details of what you guys are are doing, I mean, what, what, what's the biggest change you've seen, I guess, either firsthand from the business or just in general in the industry in the past two years? Well, the industry is growing exponentially. Uh, Mm -hmm. We are hearing more and more drivers getting on the road. And, you know, I know anecdotally there's people who talk about, you know, drivers leaving the the game after a few months, there being a Mm -hmm. lot of turnover. What we're seeing are drivers who are sticking around. You know, we Mm -hmm. talk to drivers every day who have been driving rideshare as their exclusive means of income for several years. This is their business. Um, And when an accident happens and they're taken off the road, these people are are left without any income. They're left without yeah. any means of putting food on the table. Um, and as rideshare becomes more ingrained in their life, you know, they've been doing it exclusively for mm-hmm. several years. Uh, there's no other means for them to to provide. Yeah. So we've yeah, seen that. Got it. Yeah, it does seem like if people are able to really figure out rideshare, they can kind of keep doing it, you know, through the bumps and the valleys and, you know, anything that Uber and Lyft might throw at them um, and kind of just make things work and figure it out. Yeah, you know, so when a driver is taken off the road, uh, Mm -hmm. whether it be because their vehicle's damaged or they've got an injury that prevents them from driving, a a lot of times it's a feeling of helplessness and it's a feeling of being lost um, and we are seeing that over and over where drivers call us and they say, what do I do? Yeah. And, and really, that's why we're here. You know, we answer those questions and we put you uh, hopefully on the path to one physical recovery and two financial mm-hmm. recovery. Yeah. So if I'm a driver and I get into an accident, um, what, uh, what are my steps? How, how, do, how do you engage typically with these drivers? Well, there's two things to think about. One is general accident advice, and two Mm. is if you're injured. Um, In every accident scene, you want to call the police right away to make a report. Mm -hmm. The police report is really the most important piece of evidence in your case because Mm. it happens at the scene or soon thereafter. Uh, You're documenting what happened, the parties who were involved, uh, what the vehicles looked like, Uh, You're getting passenger contact information, which can sometimes be really difficult to find after the fact. Um, So that needs to be step one. Uh, After you make that report, um, you know, the rest of the steps follow. Got it. Yeah. I mean, so is there anything that uh, I guess that, you know, I guess that's what happens once you get in the accident. Is there anything drivers do beforehand? What have you seen? Like what's sort of the number one or two recommendations? I know we've always told drivers they should get a dash cam and I guess proper insurance too. I'm, I'm assuming those are helpful. I'm, I'm curious to know if it um, is a must get or not. That's it. When you drive for Uber or Lyft or any other rideshare company, you mm. need to understand that you're an entrepreneur. 
Yeah. You own your own business and you need to ensure that you protect that business. Yeah. Uh, the first thing is making sure that you get that rideshare endorsement. That's mm -hmm. gonna do a couple things for you. Um, one, it's gonna fill gaps that the Uber and Lyft insurance policies have in terms of property damage coverage. Uh, there's high deductibles uh, on both those policies. Uh, sometimes they don't provide uninsured motorists. So if somebody hits you mm -hmm. and flees the scene or if somebody hits you that doesn't have insurance, um, your rideshare endorsement is gonna come in and make sure that you're properly covered and, and protected. Um, and number two, what you hit on is the dash cam. Yeah. Uh, that's an insurance policy in and of itself. So we see cases in which uh, there's discrepancy as to how an accident happened. The dash cam is submitted to the insurance company and the camera doesn't lie. So yeah. <laughs> it confirms your, uh, you know, your version of the events. It's gonna help you prove your claim. If there happens to be a false accusation against you, it's gonna mm -hmm. uh, confirm that as well. So when we talk about what do you need to do? It's insurance and it means yeah. policies and it means dash cams. Got it. So let's talk about some of these cases because I think one of the unique positions that you're in is that you're dealing with, like you said, hundreds of drivers who get into accidents. So what are you seeing as far as, is there, are there common trends with the cases that you're taking or the cases that you're seeing? What, what do we, let's dig into the cases for a second. Well, you know, I think a, a good place to start is the number one mistake that drivers make after accidents in which mm -hmm. they're injured. So a lot of times drivers will feel pain, but decide not to get treatment because yeah. they're worried about the costs or they don't have health insurance or whatever the reason. Getting treatment is the first step to proving your injury claim. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm never going to tell somebody to get treatment that they don't need. But if you are feeling pains, if you're feeling limitations, things aren't getting better a day or two after the accident, you've got to get in to see a doctor. Got Whether it. it's a hospital, a primary care doctor, in urgent care, it doesn't really matter, but you're starting the process. And when insurance companies ultimately decide whether you've got a valid case, whether your mm -hmm. injury claim is worthy of compensation, they're gonna wanna know how soon after the accident did you go get that treatment? And if yeah. there's a large gap, they're much more likely to deny your claim. Interesting. And I will say, you know, one of the things, uh, you know, one of the reasons why I want to have you on too is a lot of uh, this advice, if not almost all of it, kind of applies to any driving, right? Not even necessarily Uber and Lyft. I think if you get into any type of accident, you're going to want to follow a lot of these steps. So I think it's definitely valuable information for a lot of people. So if I'm a driver, I get into an accident, um, what, you know, what if I don't have health insurance or, you know, what if I'm just a typical driver who probably isn't going to go, <laughs> you know, to the doctor, right. maybe I'm trying to tough it out. Is it too late? At that point or uh, what can they do no if you're the typical driver or a rideshare driver or you know anybody else on the mm -hmm. roadway could bicyclist pedestrian yeah if you get involved in an auto accident and you feel pain toughing it out is really the worst thing that you can do because mm -hmm. if those pains don't resolve and you've waited a couple weeks or a month to go to the doctor the insurance companies are going to, to say well why didn't you go get treatment people that are hurt go get yeah. help and if you don't, you're almost admitting, well, it wasn't that bad, or Got it might it. not be related. Um, so you're right, Harry, everything that we're saying here today in terms of medical treatment applies to rideshare driver, or, uh, you know, non-rideshare driver alike. Yeah, so are there any other uh, big mistakes or pitfalls you see drivers making uh, after the fact? Uh, you know, a lot of times drivers feel bad that an accident occurred. They've got mm -hmm. a passenger in the car, um, they're not really sure what they should be doing or what they should be saying. Um, they're trying to provide good customer service for the person mm -hmm. who's you know, sitting behind them. Don't admit fault at the scene. Uh, yeah. A lot of times drivers want to say, oh, I'm so sorry that this happened. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I didn't see them, you know, whatever comes to mind at first to provide good customer service. Admitting fault is oftentimes fatal to an injury claim or an insurance claim down the road. You don't want to make that decision yourself. That's yeah. for the insurance companies. That's for the attorneys to figure out. And your statement at the scene could put a nail in that coffin. Got it. And are you guys typically working with drivers and passengers? Uh, most of our clients are drivers. Mm -hmm. um, we have really gone to focus on serving the rideshare driver community. Uh, yeah. We do handle cases for passengers when they come along. Uh, but we're finding that we fit in really nicely with the driver community. We've been advocates for them yeah. um, for years now. 
uh, you know, I've been out holding picket signs myself. Um, and you know, it's, it's important to us that we build that community and, and yeah. we're here for the job. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's definitely one thing I recognize over the years. So kind of getting away from the insurance um, and accident topics for a second, I'm curious to know what what can you explain and talk a little bit more about what you've done on sort of the advocacy side and kind of how you built that um, brand among drivers? Because I definitely uh, see you guys out there quite a bit and definitely agree. Right. Well, Legal Rideshare doesn't just want to serve one aspect of the driving community. When we see injustice in the rideshare community, we want to step up and, and provide an answer or provide mm -hmm. a voice that might not otherwise be there. Um, so an example would be in Chicago, there was a rideshare uh, advertisement ban, meaning mm -hmm. drivers could not display ads in or on their cars. We took that case to federal court, mm -hmm. um, brought it on First Amendment grounds, saying that drivers have an absolute right to display advertisements in their vehicles. The city dropped the case uh, you know, soon after it was brought, realizing that they had um, mm. a losing argument. Um, and we, we're, I'm looking right outside now and I see a couple of rooftop ads driving by. Nice. We've got people who are wrapping their vehicles. And ultimately that means extra income for drivers. It provides steady yeah. income, a floor to earnings. Um, and, you know, we're happy to be those advocates uh, to, to put money in people's pockets. Yeah. Yeah. So it sounds like you guys are actually working, you know, beyond just the accident side of things and, you know, sort of the, the causes and cases that uh, drivers, you know, might need advo advocates for. Um, are there any other uh, areas besides that? Yeah. When, you know, AB5 is a big topic right now mm -hmm. in California and we're seeing other states uh, proposing similar regulations. Um, yeah. If you're unfamiliar, AB5 is, is really giving employee benefits um, to rideshare and, and gig workers. Um, mm -hmm. Drivers fall on all sides of that issue. Some people want to be employees, some people don't want to be employees. But what we ultimately need to see or, or, or work for is fairness. Yeah. Um, coronavirus is a huge <laughs> topic right now. Um, we're seeing that drivers are being taken off work, unable mm -hmm. to drive. Uh, rideshare companies are saying, if you feel ill, don't work. Yeah. Um, and for an extended period of time, they were not providing compensation. They were mm. uh, assuming that the driver somehow had the means to stay at home and, and not work their nine to five or yeah. five to nine, you know, whatever hours you're working. <laughs> yeah. um, we stepped up, we provided a sick day program. Mm -hmm. We provided compensation to drivers who were medically diagnosed with the flu and or diagnosed with uh, coronavirus um, to at least provide that, again, floor. Um, yeah. We want people to be able to keep their heads above water. And thankfully, uh, with the advocacy that we several other organizations, mm -hmm. Uber and Lyft have stepped up and at least yeah. they've now got a little cushion uh, for the drivers. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I really like the example you shared about sort of, you know, I guess it was suing the city of Chicago in order to give drivers, um, you know, the ability to advertise. And I think generally, you know, there's a lot of these other topics, like you mentioned, AB5 and coronavirus, um, which who knows uh, if people are listening now, you know, a week or two after we've recorded this, who knows what the status of that will be. But uh, are there any other sort of, I guess, like unique legal opportunities for you to advocate on behalf of drivers? Or do you find that it's just sort of more general? We're talking about driver rights, driver benefits, and if there is a situation in which a driver feels like their rights have been violated, we're certainly interested in hearing about it. Yeah. Um, you know, we hear about deactivations, we hear about um, false accusations. Uh, these are topics that are important to our community because they affect drivers' ability to work, to keep work, um, and to feed their families. Yeah. So. You know, we have been looking at this from all different angles, and if we can find avenues to assist a driver in, you know, in keeping their, you know, their employment status, keeping their mm -hmm. ability to get behind the wheel, we're going to take that opportunity, and we're happy to do it. Yeah, definitely. So, are you guys primarily working with drivers in Illinois, or how do you handle uh, cases that come in from outside Illinois? So, we're based in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, our, our office space is in Chicago, but we help drivers nationwide and we can help navigate insurance claims. Uh, you know, we make claims for drivers uh, with lost wages, with yeah. medical bills um, in all 50 states. 
So do not hesitate to give us a call because there's a good chance that we can assist you. And if for some reason that distance barrier, you know, you yeah. being in, say, California and us being in, uh, in Illinois uh, makes it so that we aren't the best option for you, I've got contacts nationwide who will be able to assist. Very cool. So, you know, one thing that I guess one observation I've had uh, since you last uh, came on two years ago is that it seems like there are a lot of other lawyers, law firm, big law firms, small firms that are really looking at, um, you know, I, mean, I guess, what do we call this? The Uber and Lyft injury, you know, space. What do you yeah, call personal the space? Injury personal injury lawyers um, that, uh, you know, I guess for whatever reason have identified Uber and Lyft as this big opportunity for them. And it's, I kind of joke sometimes that I get like an email every single week from a different lawyer <laughs> asking me about, um, you know, we, can, can you, you know, mention our services for free or whatever to all your drivers? And I usually um, obviously ignore them. But um, <laughs> it's just funny. It seems like the amount of interest in this space has really heated up in the past two years from the actual lawyers. I'm curious to know why you think that is. Well, lot, lawyers are looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. And when they see a bunch of drivers on the road, it, you know, it, they recognize that those drivers may be involved in accidents that either they cause or somebody else causes. Yeah. And, you know, that's an opportunity for some law firms. What we've done is made our entire practice based on rideshare. We are mm -hmm. legal rideshare. Yeah. These other firms that you see are Smith & Smith or <laughs> uh, Johnson & Johnson or, you know, whatever whatever two names you want to put in front of that law firm. Sometimes three. <laughs> sometimes three, if they're really successful. Right? Um, we want to make sure that our focus is the rideshare community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we navigate these cases all the time. Yeah. Uh, the, the truth is a, another injury attorney probably could figure it out, but mm -hmm. we know how to get you what you need as quickly as possible. We've got yeah. the contacts at the, the rideshare's, um, insurance companies. Mm -hmm. We've got the contacts at the the law firms that defend uh, Uber and Lyft. We're going to hit the ground running where all these other guys are going to have to figure it out. Yeah, I will say that it's kind of an interesting trend I've seen over the years is that whenever there's this new product or new opportunity, I saw this big time with rideshare insurance is that, you know, if you go to an insurance agent or if you go to a lawyer and you say, hey, you know, I'm ready to sue Uber and Lyft or, you know, I need this type of insurance, even if they don't have any real expertise in that, they sort of go, like you said, and they try to figure it out. And it seems like more often than not, I mean, you might still be able to get something out of it, but there's definitely value in, you know, going to that expert. So that's sort of one of the reasons why, you know, I enjoy sending drivers to you so much because I kind of know that they're going to get the best treatment versus, you know, you could go to any probably personal injury lawyer. And if you tell them you have a case against Uber or Lyft, of course, they're going to say, yes, I'm an expert. I love that. I'll take it. Right, but I, I right. do see this come up time and time again um, that, uh, you know, when they do go that option and, you know, this is not just in the, uh, you know, sort of personal injury space, but it's also right share insurance. And it's also right. with these app developers that I work with, you know, if you're starting a rideshare company. So it's definitely a lot of uh, areas of mobility for sure. Yeah. And we often see clients coming into our door who say, look, I signed up with another lawyer. I found them right after the accident or I, they're a family friend, but I don't feel like this is working out in a way that benefits me. And I'm mm -hmm. interested in making a change. And, you know, if you're not happy with your current representation, that's something that you're entitled to change. We would be happy to assist and at least tell you, you know, I think that the guy that you're working with has figured it out or, yeah, it sounds like things aren't going so well. So why don't you maybe let it, let us take a look? Yeah. So do you deal often with uh, the actual companies, Uber and Lyft? Uh, we deal with Uber, Lyft, their insurance companies, their mm -hmm. lawyers. Um, it depends on the case. Every case is going to be different. But uh, the, the simple answer is yes. I mean, we've got contacts at both companies. Hmm. How, do you, how do you typically engage? I mean, is it more because I mean, I guess Uber and Lyft, right? If a drop, one of your clients um, gets into an accident and, you, you know, you start going through the process, I'm, I'm assuming it's not with Uber and Lyft. I'm assuming it's with their insurers, right? Uh, an accident claim is almost always with the insurance company. Uh, there are times in which the, the company itself gets involved. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the initial letters that I'm sending out, the initial contacts are all going to be to the insurance companies that, that provide coverage to the rideshare companies. Mm. Um, we see more company involvement in claims like assault cases, uh, things that, that may get bad publicity, mm. um, you know, a drinking and driving mm -hmm. or 
um, you know, something along those lines. The company has an interest in protecting its image, and yeah. and that's when I might get a phone call from one of the you know the top dogs. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense, of course. Um, so, what's a sort of typical scenario? How do these play out? I don't know if you can share how much. Feel free to share as much detail as you can, but you know, in sort of like, do you have average cases or average judgments, or how did these, um, you know, typically work out for drivers, or maybe a, a best and a worst, <laughs> whatever you're comfortable <laughs> well, sharing. Let me let me tell you that an accident and injury claim is like anything else; it's very mm -hmm. fact specific. Yeah. So, you know, you you might hear of a driver who gets rear-ended, has an emergency room visit, and then one follow-up with their doctor. That's mm -hmm. gonna be an entirely different case than somebody who is uh, badly injured to the point that they need a surgery and they're treating for several years. Yeah. Um, cases can can run the gamut and uh, you know we don't really, at my firm, we wanna assist everybody. So yeah. we take quote unquote small cases, we take mm -hmm. quote unquote big cases. It's getting the driver the reimbursement, the, mm -hmm. the compensation that they need that's really important to us because that hospital bill for five grand, yeah. that, that might eat at a driver just as much as the couple hundred thousand that you know the person with the surgery has. Yeah. If you can't afford to pay the bill, you need to get it taken care of or else it's gonna affect your livelihood and, and your happiness. Yeah. So typically if, you know, I guess in the past, so I'll, I'll be honest, I've gotten into an accident or two in my life, not while driving Uber or Lyft, but I've gotten into an accident or two and it was a pretty straightforward process. I think I ended up probably getting a check in the mail or taking uh, my car in and there were no, you know, sort of real damages, you know, I guess physically to myself, but I, you know, it was probably a couple thousand dollars in repairs and that was that. What are drivers typically, you know, when they're coming on the personal injury side, I'm assuming that it's a lot more than just the damage to their car like you said right if there's uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of medical bills what, what are what are they I guess entitled to if that's the right word well let me um, let me use your example as as an example mm -hmm. um, if you have a property damage case in yeah. which you're you know you've got a bump to your to your uh, you know door or there's a situation mm -hmm. in which even your car's totaled yeah drivers can typically handle those cases on their own the mm -hmm. attorney is not going to add enough value to that case to make it Got worth it. the attorney's fee. I say the same thing for cases in which a driver has very minimal treatment. So mm -hmm. if you go to the doctor one time, the value that I bring to your case might not be enough to make it worth your time to, to bring me on. Got it. Um, however, if that injury and the property damage combined keeps you out of work for a month, Mm -hmm. Well, then all, we're talking about a different story. Yeah. I tell drivers all the time, when you have more than one doctor's visit, when you've got some lost wages, that's where the lawyers going to step in and make more time and your resources mm -hmm. to come in and see us. Yeah, no, that's interesting um, because it, it does sound like they're entitled to a lot more than, you know, the, I guess the property damage, right? There's the lost wages and uh, I think it's called pain and suffering and all of that, right? Right. So after an accident claim, a driver is going to be entitled to the cost of the property damage, mm -hmm. uh, the cost of the medical bills, pain and suffering, which is actually the pain that you're feeling, mm -hmm. uh, and what we call loss of normal life, which is the inability to do activities that you could typically do. Mm -hmm. So some people might have an injury that keeps them from you know, cooking or cleaning or yeah. uh, exercising or you know, whatever hobbies you may have, say for six weeks. You're mm -hmm. entitled to compensation for that because that altered your life materially. Yeah. materially. Um, you are also entitled to any sort of uh, disfigurement. So we mm -hmm. have a, a client who just came in who suffered a, a pretty nasty cut to his face um, mm -hmm. after a rideshare accident. That client is going to have a scar in the middle of his face. That mm -hmm. That's something that's changing his life. That's something that's mm -hmm. changing his self-esteem. Um, so, you know, we are ready to claim every element of damages that we can. Um, and, and those are some, you know, just to name a few. 
Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. That is a, uh, you know, sort of obviously not a situation that anyone uh, desires to be in, but if you are in, stuck in that situation, you know, I think there's good reasons to sort of turn to the pros, turn to the experts who kind of know what they're doing. Is there a limit on the damages that you can get as a driver? I mean, for example, I know we always see that Uber and Lyft have a $1 million uh, insurance liability policy. I don't know if that's a limit um, to maybe the damages that they might pay out or how do, you know, how do these terms that we hear thrown around in regards to Uber and Lyft's uh, insurance, uh, you know, affect things here? So generally speaking, uh, Uber and Lyft would provide underinsured or uninsured motorist coverage to the, the driver. Mm -hmm. um, that's not often the, the first policy that you go after. If there's mm -hmm. an at-fault driver who has insurance, mm -hmm. you go through that driver's insurance first. Got it. And if your damages reach that driver's policy limits, say they've got mm -hmm. a $25,000 policy, you collect that, and then you can go to Uber for that underinsured coverage. And Uber mm -hmm. would then provide up to a million dollars, depending on your your injury. Um, it's important to note that just because Uber has a million dollars, doesn't mean <laughs> you're going to get a million dollars. Got it. Um, that's just that's going to be the cap at at the value of your claim. Yeah. And so I know for a while, uh, Uber's insurer was James Rivers. And it, I, I think we actually wrote an article earlier in the year that kind of announced that James Rivers, I think, uh, was dropping Uber and which made me, you know, assume that, wow, there are a lot more accidents happening than probably these guys want to deal with. Or it, I'm curious to know yeah. just at a high level what you've seen, you know, and sort of whether it's accident rates or sort of the willingness to insure Uber and Lyft, since you're definitely someone in a unique position to have right. that insight. Well, with James River specifically, it's been really interesting to watch their change in attitude throughout mm. this, you know, rideshare experiment, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Um, when we opened up in 2015, James River was it. That's who mm. we were dealing with for almost every Uber claim, and it. it was actually a pleasure to to work with them. They, mm. I thought that they looked at cases fairly. I mm. thought that they um, appropriately evaluated. Uh, the value of the case. And, you know, 99% of the time we were able to um, resolve a case to everybody's satisfaction. The driver mm -hmm. you know, got what they deserved. Mm -hmm. As time went on, I noticed that they started to get a little bit stingier, that they started to look at things um, a little more closely and, and assert some legal defenses that I thought might not be valid or, mm -hmm. you know, at least were on shaky ground. Um, and then here we are today, uh, they're fighting everything, hmm. you know, so it, today more than ever, you need that lawyer advocating for you because the insurance companies are looking at things with a pretty skeptical eye. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with, like you said, the number of accidents that came through, yeah. uh, and also the relationship with Uber, with Uber that deteriorated. Do you think, did you notice any changes when they IPO'd and sort of, you know, I guess on my end, it definitely clearly seems like, you know, they're trying to get more towards profitability. Obviously, they've kind of even announced that they're trying to head towards profitability. Um, do you think that's playing a role here? Uh, you know, I don't know that the IPOs for Uber and Lyft have changed the way that they're evaluating claims, mm -hmm. but it has changed the way that they're presenting themselves to the public. So mm -hmm. you see the safety report that came out for Uber. Yeah. There's no way that they would have done that unilaterally unless the public demanded it, the media demanded it, and they thought that you know ultimately investors needed to see it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a change in public relations and um, how that touches accident and injuries uh, I guess we're going to have to see, but I, I haven't seen that yet. Yeah, you know, interesting. So uh, just quickly, do do most of your cases actually end up settling or do these ever go to, I guess, a, a trial or a judge or <laughs> what's the actual you know outcome in a lot of scenarios for you and your clients? So in litigation in general, the vast majority of cases settle. Um, okay. There are cases that go to trial, that go to arbitration. Um, but most of the time the parties are able to find a meeting of the minds, uh, mm. find a, a value that works, um, to, to fairly compensate the driver. And sometimes mm. it takes, uh, you know, more time and, and perhaps more, uh, effort. Um, but ultimately we get it done and whether yeah. that means, you know, taking 20 depositions and going to the medical mm. providers and, uh, saying, doctor, you've got to explain to the insurance company exactly what's wrong mm with, you know, with my client, you know, we get that testimony, we send it to the insurance company and we say, let's go.
it's time to settle this thing. Interesting. So I guess on Uber's side, you're now working with multiple insurance companies and who's Lyft's insurance company right now? Uh, so right now, York Risk Services is, is still overseeing a lot of the claims. Uh, Progressive for um, Lyft. is, I'm sorry? York for is Lyft. for Lyft, yeah. York is for Lyft. Um, and Progressive is taking over a lot of those Lyft claims as well in Illinois. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, for Uber? Uh, for Uber, Allstate is is taking over the majority of cases. Uh, there are also claims, um, you know, in other states. We're seeing other companies pop up here and there, but the vast majority is Allstate. Interesting. Yeah, no, it was a interesting, you know, because I think I've heard from others that have told me similar that, you know, James Rivers has kind of gotten a little stingier over the years. Um, so I, I will be curious to kind of watch that trend. And, you know, I guess I would assume that, you know, it would be, you know, more and more difficult, but it does seem like uh, you guys are eventually able to settle a lot of these cases. Like you said, it just is a lot more work. So I guess going forward, is, is there anything you think uh, drivers should be thinking about or anything that you're sort of looking forward to, you know, keeping your eye on in the next year, a couple years? Well, you know, drivers, as I said at the beginning of our, of our podcast, Mm -hmm. need to make sure that they are taking themselves seriously as business people. Mm -hmm. uh, when you sign into the app, you, you can't just think of yourself as going out one night to make a couple bucks because yeah. things can change really quickly. Yeah. If you're driving down the street and you get rear-ended and you get hurt or your passenger gets hurt, your life is different from that, that day going forward. Mm -hmm. So protect yourself from the onset. Make sure that you've got the right insurance make sure that you've got the dash cam and don't take chances in you know not getting a consultation with a lawyer as soon as possible give me yeah. a call shoot me an email visit my website if nothing else i'll be able to tell you which path to take mm -hmm. how to handle a call from the insurance company and how to best protect your interests going forward if you wait a week if you wait a month it's going to be harder so yeah. there's just simply no reason to wait Cool. Yeah. And we'll definitely leave a link uh, to your information in the show notes is if drivers want to get a hold of you um, or just anyone in general curious more, to learn more about your services, where's the best place? Uh, uh, I guess I'm looking at you right now and I see at legal rideshare. So I assume if I type that into any search box, you guys should <laughs> pop up, but maybe you have more uh, specific contact info we can leave in the show notes. So legalrideshare.com is our website. And on there, you can actually send us a message directly. It's going to come oh. to my inbox. So um, don't hesitate to reach out there. You can call us at 312-767-7950. Um, and you can also email us at help, H-E-L-P, at legalrideshare.com. Every single one of those contact forms is going to get back to me, um, and I will reach out to you to make sure that you're taken care of. Very cool, Brian. Well, I appreciate all the work that uh, you're doing for drivers, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again in the future. Thanks, Harry. It was great chatting with you.